is he that hath clean hands and a pure heart and does not lift his soul up to what is false. We're going to see this morning as we get back to our study through the book of Hosea in chapter 2 that this was a big struggle for the people in the Old Testament to not lift their soul up to what is false. And um, it's a call for us to respond in faith and repentance as we do every Sunday. So if you do have your Bibles, please turn to Hosea chapter 2 for the public reading. I'm going to read all of the chapter. This will be 23 verses. And we will start in verse 1, though I will say this, that verse 1 does technically, it's a hinge verse. It does go with what we talked about last week, and it leads into what we are going to talk about this week. And to kind of speak a little bit on our schedule, next week we will have a visiting, I don't know if we said this uh, in the announcements, but we're going to have a visiting preacher next week uh, from the Gideons. Is that, that, is, that is correct. I'm looking for a little amen or a head nod. I believe that is right. Um, his name is uh, Monty Matlock, so y'all be sure to welcome him, but we will take a break from Hosea. We'll pick it back up with chapter 3 on the following week. All right, so hopefully you've made it there. Would you please, if you are able, please stand in the honor of God's word. Hosea chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Say to your brothers, you are my people, and to your sisters, you have received mercy. Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband, that she put away her whoring from my face and her adultery from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and make her as in the day she was born, and make her like a wilderness, and make her like a parched land, and kill her with thirst. Upon her children also I will have no mercy, because they are children of whoredom, for their mother has played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who gave me, or who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, I will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. She shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return again to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Therefore, I will take back my grain in its time and my wine in its season, and I will take away my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. And I will put an end to all her mirth, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her appointed feasts, and I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees, of which she said, These are my wages, which my lovers have given me. I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall devour them, and I will punish her for the feast days of the bales, which she burned, when she burned offerings to them, and adorned herself with her ring and jewelry, and went after her lovers and forgot me, declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt, and in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal. For I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day when, with the beasts of the fields, the birds of the heavens, and the creeping things around them. And I will abolish the bow and the sword and the war from the land. 
and I will make you lie down in safety, and I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And in that day I will answer, declares the Lord, I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth. And the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, and the oil, and they shall answer Jezreel. And I will sow her for myself in the land, and I will have mercy on no mercy, and I will say to not my people, you are my people, and he shall say, you are my God. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you for this text, and I do pray that we would stop and hear exactly what you want to say, and I pray that we would hear your heart, and that your heart would draw us to yourself, and that we would be once again captivated, allured, so that we're not led astray by the many temptations that are around us in this world. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's be seated. Antonio Stradivari, I think it's his name, made violins a very long time ago. And they are known as the Stradivarius violin, which some of you know of. And you probably know more about than I do. I did a little research on this, and this amazing craftsman, you might say, made these violins so well that they people have tried to reproduce them with all our technology, and we cannot make them the way that they were made back in the day. They're very, very good. They have such a pure sound. He is widely regarded as the best violin maker in the world. Some of his violins go for $16 million a piece. And I remember this uh, moment in, in, uh, when I was in my Hebrews class, not, not the language, but the book, uh, on the book of Hebrews. And the teacher came up to the front and he said, and he was holding this, uh, I would say, remote control. And he said, let's imagine that this is a Stradivarius. And he's turning it around in his hand, and we're all just captivated, and we're looking at him. And he said, you know, marriage is a lot like this Stradivarius. It's precious. It's priceless. Now, let's just pretend, and I was sitting in the front row, you know, listening like this, because he's a great teacher. And he says, let's just pretend that I do something with it like this, and throw it at me in the middle of class, and here I... Didn't even catch it. Smash on the ground. The batteries went everywhere. And I, and I knew he was going to do that. I kind of knew in the back of my mind. He's like, he's going to throw this to me. I know he's going to do this. And then he did this. And I still wasn't. I just boom, 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 boom. It was probably funnier because the thing bounced five or six times in the air and then broke on the ground. And he was trying to make a point. And it was an easy point to make. We take things like marriage and put a lesser value on it than a piece of wood that will go for $16 million. And we hold it and we make sure that this precious thing is not misused. You know, I had this happen to me once. My father went to South Africa to work at this chemical plant. He used to work for British Petroleum. And uh, he came back bearing gifts and we got some awesome gifts. I still have uh, some gifts today. We have these little rhinoceri figurines. And, you know, we as kids, we held on to these things. I, actually, I still hold on to it. I don't know where it is, but I know I have it somewhere. My brother, he got a, an Apollo a, a, a skin of, you know, a deer. And it was so cool. It was like, and I was kind of jealous. I kind of like wanted that thing. And, you know, he put it on his bed. And I was like, you know, trying to sneak it away and everything. He brought me this ostrich egg, South African ostrich egg that was like this big. And you can imagine me as, as, as a little boy, probably second, third grade. I carried that thing everywhere. Um, I wanted to take it to show and tell. And my mom tells me, you know, that she was so mad because the teacher wouldn't let me bring it to show and tell. And, you know, but nonetheless, I took it with me everywhere. And I was sitting there doing homework one day at the kitchen table. And I had it right next to me. I was just sitting there doing homework. And I'm looking at this problem. And then all of a sudden, I hear. <laughs> crash. And it had rolled off the kitchen table and shattered into a thousand pieces. I was so heartbroken 
at that moment because it's not like you could just go back to South Africa and get another one and then come back, you know? Um, which he did, by the way. Um, he had a friend that I think picked one up for me and replaced that one. But my brother, I was so broken. I was just weeping, weeping. My brother was so broken about this. He ran to my mom who was sitting in the living room and hopped in her lap and was just weeping. And she was like, what did you do? Did you throw that off the thing? And of course he didn't. He, it was just, he was broken hearted by the fact that I was broken hearted. Right? Because dad had given me this, you know. And we all wept together. We thought this is the end, you know, that was my prized possession. Again, my dad is awesome and he went and got me another one I still have, but I don't keep it on top of the, you know, table like I did. Then I learned my lesson. These precious things. Let me ask you something. What is precious to the Lord? What does he pour into? Because he has things that are precious to him. It, there's no mistake that the Bible starts with marriage. That's not a mistake. It ends with a scene, a magnificent scene of marriage. And the thing that's in the middle that shatters, you might say, his heart, that breaks his heart, is a broken marriage covenant. Because, like that Stradivarius violin, it has had heart poured into it, time poured into it, thought pour, poured into it, covenant poured into it, love poured into it. And here we are in this chapter, close to the middle of the Bible, and this thing, this marriage covenant, is the best thing that we can, even earthly covenant uh, idea that we can see that relates to God's relationship to His people, and it's broken. And we see very clearly what God loves, what God cares about. And we're supposed to feel this. We're supposed to understand something about God's heart here. This is what is precious to Him. And we are easily able to see it. And we learn a lot about ourselves in the process too. And so for this sermon, what I want to do is I want to make three main points but there's an overarching point that all three kind of go into. And it's this, that God has precious love for his people. He has a deep affection for his people. In order to bring that out, I want to bring, out, uh, I want to bring uh, three major points, that subpoints that kind of make that main point. And the first one is this. We get a picture here in this text of this major point, of this major picture, I should say. This, that we get a picture of the Lord's lovesick bride. I use that language uh, on purpose. You're going to see it through, throughout the rest of the book. But here we have a picture of the Lord's lovesick bride, a heart that is lovesick. Now what verses can we point to that can make this picture come alive for us? Well, this is a court scene, sort of. Many commentators have said that this is like a court scene with a couple of uh, accusations within a, and then with a response. You can see this kind of in verse 2. The word says plead in the ESV. The KJV may say something like exhort. I don't quite know. But the word is almost like an exhortation. Like, exhort your mother. Understand this. This is, this is the case I'm bringing against her. She's not my wife. I'm not her husband. She's broken covenant with me. She needs to put away her hoarding from my face. Her lewdness. Her adulterous behavior. Now is this Hosea speaking actually to his sons and about his wife? Probably this is a, more like a sermon. In reference to Israel. In other words, he's saying to Israel, you are committing spiritual adultery. And I'm pleading, I'm exhorting you, I'm tell, telling the people of Israel to say, to start preaching themselves and say, we've got to turn away from our idolatry. We must. And we must do it quick. Because something's going to happen, verse 3, I'm going to strip her naked. Make her a wilderness, kill her with thirst. But why is she going after these bales 
and the and this these idols in the culture we can see this most explicitly in verse 5 their mother has played the whore Hosea doesn't mince words by the way she who convinced conceived them has acted shamefully and here's the verse she said I will go after my lovers notice that language I will go after my lovers not my husband my lovers now again this is a picture of Israel chasing idols but notice what happens right after she says this who give me my bread and my water my wool and my flax my oil and my drink this is very confused love here is a picture of a woman here who has a love affair going on with her lovers not her husband and she's saying they are my providers that's the picture they're the ones who give me my provisions now how does this tie into the culture it's really easy Baal worship an idol Baal worship was everywhere they that was the fertility God children wine oil flax all that was seen to come from this false God and they were giving into that worship well the Lord is turning this on to with marriage terminology and saying you're going after other lovers and you're saying they're my providers and not my husband Look in verse 8. We see this most explicitly. It says, and she did not know. Look at that confused love, the total ignorance there. She's so wrapped up in her own whoredom. She did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. I want you to imagine this. You're a husband. Here's a husband, goes to work. And in the middle of the day, he goes online and he's wanting to romance his wife. And he sends flowers and a box of chocolates. You know, the chocolates that are the good chocolates that start with the letter G and it's like Italian sounding. I can't even pronounce it. Okay? It's really good. And sends that where? To, to the address with a little, little, little name you know, thing, real pretty writing, calligraphy, pay a little extra for that, with, your, with his wife's name on it, it arrives at her work. And you want it, you, you say, and you sign it, you say, I want it signed, you know, calligraphy, nice letters, from your lover. And you know, something really romantic, right? It gets there, she gets to work, and she sees it there on the table, and oh, and her heart starts to, beat really fast you know it's really romantic and she thinks it's coming from the people she's having an affair with the thing that makes her heart beat are the thought it is the thought that yes this did come from my lover but that lover's not my husband and then she gets home later on that day Let's unpack the story. He walks in later than her from work. It's been a tough day at work. He's been thinking about her. And she's got a snarly attitude and she resents him because she, he never does anything like that for her. What her lovers would do. How confused is that woman? And how heartbroken would that husband be? He think, he's pouring out, he's lavishing on this woman everything that her, heart's, her heart wants and makes her heart speed up and she's crediting to it to her lovers who are numerous. And there's all that contention. This is the picture that you get with the people of Israel. Their heart races after false gods. And God is the one that is lavishing the gifts on them. What's interesting about this is that her lovers did, don't even deliver. Pragmatically, her lovers don't even care about her. They don't give her the gifts. They care nothing for her. Only what they can get from her. 
And then they leave her by the wayside. Just like the beast in Revelation. We have to remember that. What happened to the woman in the, uh, in the last book of the Bible? When the beast took that woman with him, he used her up and then ate her. Because that's, that's what Satan will do. He will be a fake husband to you all day long. Just to get what he wants out of you. And at the end of the day, he'll just eat you piece by piece. Doesn't care a thing for you. That is not God's heart. That is not God's heart. His lo their lovers didn't even return. They even, she'll even say in verse 7, She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. She shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then she will say, Well, I'll go and return to my first husband. It was better for me then than it is now. How lovesick is her heart using God's provisions for Baal worship. This goes along with what we read earlier, uh, the middle scripture reading from Amos. They, they preach to similar audiences, okay? What you're going to find about these minor prophets is kind of interesting is this. They spoke to similar audiences, similar culture going on. He, and, and the Lord comes in, he says, I can't stand your festivals. I can't stand your songs. In Isaiah chapter 1, when you come to appear before me, who has required this of you, this trampling of my courts? You spread out your hands before me in worship, but your hands are covered in blood, and I'm turning away from it. The Lord couldn't stand it. Why? Because their worship services were mixed with idolatry. It was horrible. There may have even been cult prostitutes doing things that would be unfitting for me to talk about publicly here. The Lord has a lovesick bride here in this text. We see it again in verse 12. I will lay waste on her vines and her fig trees, of which she said, These are my wages, which my lover has given to me. Finally, we see a culmination of it is this. Her lovesick heart is confused so much. Look at verse 16. God's going to make it right, but look what they said. And in that day declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my Baal. That's how confusing it was for them. That's how lovesick and lost they were. Well, that's the picture. I need to make a quick side note before I move on to the next point, which is going to be God's response to his lovesick bride. You know, we don't worship, I hope, <laughs> we don't worship Baal, who is a false idol. I hope you don't do that. If you do, you should repent. That doesn't make any sense. But I do think that there is somewhat of a temptation, isn't, isn't there, in our culture to do something similar to Baal? I mean, after all, didn't Baal in their culture provide all the necessities, like water and food and central heating and air and maybe, you know, lower taxes, free health care for some people and on and on and on. We could, we could go on. And there's a tendency in our culture to look to, say, the executive office for all the answers and all the provisions. Or to say, woe is me when it's not going to deliver. Your fear comes in because your hope is shattered because maybe the person in office is not what you wanted. There is a temptation here in our own country to look to our leaders as our providers. And we must, must fight against this. We must fight against our president becoming our bail. Don't we? I also want to make this point too, and I'll come around to it again. There's not a one-for-one one parallel between our nation and the nation of Israel. We, we shouldn't say America is Israel. Here's why. Because the Lord did not covenant with America the way he did with Israel. He is in a particular covenant with this people. That covenant does not exist with America. That should not be promoted. That should not be, we shouldn't see ourselves as a nation that is in covenant as a nation that is in covenant with God like it is here because it's not. It's not. 
There's nowhere that in the Bible. There is a new covenant that is operative right now, but that is with Christ. So I'll come back to that a little bit later, but there's not a one-for-one -one parallel there. No, there are principles we can pull from it. We are, our hearts, in the words of Calvin, tend to be idol factories. Or we just make new idols all the time. And we must fight against this. But let's look and see what the Lord decides to do with his lovesick bride. It's quite shocking. Here's the first thing. The Lord has a plan to punish. The Lord has a plan to punish. You see this in verse 6. Okay, you also see this in verse 9. And there's a wonderful word that helps us with understanding the Bible. You ready for it? Therefore. Great word. Therefore. So he's already stated, here's this woman who's doing all her whoredom. Therefore, here's what I'm going to do. I will hedge up her way. I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. In other words, I'm going to put a fence, I'm going to put a little prison around her so she can't go and look for all this stuff to satisfy her lovesick heart. I'm going to ground her spiritually. Then he goes on and look at verse 9. I will take back my, gr my grain in its time. So those things that, that they trusted in, they say they came from Baal. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy I have this extra grain this year. Thank you, Baal. I'm going to take that back, God says. Just so you know, I'm the one that has control over all that. I'm going to take it back. I'm going to take back my wine in its season, my wool, my flax, all that stuff, the essentials. I'm going to take it back from you. Why? Because I don't care about you. No, because I do care about you. Because you're attributing it to the wrong provider. It belongs to me and I'm taking it back. He goes further. And it gets pretty graphic. If you look in verse 12. Oh, let's, let's go to verse... Uh, let's, let's jump all the way back to 10. This will be better. Look at how many times the word I will occurs. This is his punishment. Now I will... Uncover her lewdness. That is, I will strip her naked in the sight of her lovers. No one shall rescue her out of my hand. That may be a reference to exile. It wouldn't be uncommon to lead exiles away to a new land in their birthday suit. They got nothing but themselves and they're in shackles. Probably it is. Probably it is because we know that the northern kingdom of Israel did go to exile and probably they were stripped of everything. Verse 11, and I will put an end to all her mirth, all that joy, all those feasts. He says that her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her appointed feasts. Stop. Why? Because there's no reason for you to be happy. You're worshiping the wrong God. And I'm going to stop you having fun. These appointed feasts, these Sabbaths are devoted. They were put in place to worship Yahweh. And now they're taking those Sabbaths and worshiping a, a, a false idol. And God's going to put an end to it. Verse 12. And I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees of which she said, These are my wages which my lovers have given me. I will make them a forest and the beasts of the earth shall devour them. And I will punish her for her feast days of the Baals when she burned offerings to them and adorned herself with ring and jewelry that may be cult prostitute language and went after her lovers and forgot me. Taking back of provisions, stripped naked, hedged in. I believe this is a long graphic way of saying the Assyrians are coming into your territory. They're going to burn everything down and you are going to be stripped naked and led away in chains to a foreign nation. That's exactly what happened. And notice who's the agent who is doing all of this. God says, I will do it. Not, I'm going to allow this to happen. He, he says this as though he's the primary causer of this punishment. I will do this. 
And we need to be able to stomach that with our theology. Our theology should be able to stomach that. God has every right to do this. But please note, please know that um, this is not unloving. Which brings me to my final point. This is hard to take in. Because we can look at that God's punishment and we can understand it, can't we? We almost can understand it in terms of how? In terms of marriage. I am told that the rage that goes through a man or a woman's heart when the adulterous act has taken place is almost uncontrollable. I am told. I have heard stories, multiple from different, different people. I'm not thinking that this is something that I could understand unless you've been there, but I don't want anyone to be there. But the rage that comes in is almost unbearable, I am told. There is, make no mistake, similar pain in this text when it comes to God being the husband of his bride. And that is okay that we understand that. That is good that we understand that. It is good that you understand that God loves and pours and pours out love and pours so much into his bride and that here, this northern kingdom of Israel has turned their back on the Lord and it is painful to the Lord. But if the text ended here, I would, I would understand it. It almost looks like a divorce, does it not? And there's even been people that advocate this is an official divorce decree. Okay? There's been... Great, smart commentators that advocate for that. And if it ended here, you would say, man, I understand. I understand. But this next point is almost, it's almost too much to take in. It's hard to understand because I'm a man and I'm sinful and I'm finite and it's hard for me to put myself into this situation to say, could this even be my heart? In order to say these next verses, this next point, and starting in verse 14, you must have a God-sized heart. It's amazing. Because he turns this coin over, and then he says, I will allure her. Now that language in Hebrew is not, um, I mean, it's, it's pretty graphic. It's seduce. I will more than just court her, I'm going to recapture that lovesick heart. It doesn't matter work it would take to do that. Well, first, first thing has to happen, they need to go into exile. They need to be stripped naked. That's going to happen. But it doesn't just stop there. I'm going to bring her back, he says. And this is all throughout the rest of the chapter, verses 14 through 23, where God says, I'm going to woo her. I'm going to seduce. I'm going to allure her again. She's going to be mine, and she's going to be overwhelming in love with me. And I want you to notice something. All the initiative is with God. All of it. All of it. It's not, I'm going to wait until she gets her act together. I will allure her. I will bring her into the wilderness. I will speak tenderly to her. I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at a time when she came out of the land of Egypt. In that day, you won't call me my Baal. You'll call me my Husband, I will remove the names of the bales from her mouth, and they shall be remembered no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the creeping things, and I will abolish the bow, the sword, the, sword, the war, and I will make you lie down in safety. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you. I will. 
betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. There's a repetition of three betrothals there, and it ends in not faithlessness, which is what she's guilty of, but faithfulness. It would be rational to say, from a man's perspective, I mean, when something so crazy as this whoredom has happened, and breaking of covenant has happened, to take that situation and throw it and say, I don't need this. That's, that is a, I can understand that as a man. And God says, let me tell you how the end of this story is going to be. I will make you love me again and I will pour even more grace on you. I'm going to love the faithlessness out of you. That is unbelievable. That is God's heart. That's his power. There's so many points I want to make. You see a Stradivarius smashed to pieces. He makes one even better. That we can't even do that. He can do this. This covenant that they were able to break. He's going to make a new one. Right? I will make a new covenant with them, he says in Jeremiah. Not like the covenant that I made with them, which they broke. I'm going to put my law within them. I'm going to put my spirit within them. And they shall know the Lord. This is talking about the new covenant that he's made with us in Christ. Unmistakable. Where a man is having this heart of stone that would always be faithless against God. Has now been removed, open heart surgery, and been replaced with a spiritual heart of flesh. And a Holy Spirit to accompany this. And filled with the love of God now. I hate the things I used to love. I love the person and the things that I used to hate. This is conversion. I love God. I am now married to God. He is my husband. That is the cry of the church. That is a converted person under the new covenant. The permanent marriage that lasts forever that we saw at the end of Revelation. That's what he's going to do with his people. He's going to keep his promise to Abraham. He's going to make sure it happens. All the initiative lies with him. A brand new unbroken ostrich egg. I will allure her. You know, there are times where we think of situations like this and we think, oh, I've just messed it up. As a believer, I've just messed it up. I have, you say, pastor or brother, I, I, you wouldn't believe what I've done. I, I've done things that will make you blush. I'm a Christian, but I've really, really messed it up. One of the things that we can learn from this text is this. Listen, if your faith is in Christ and you repent of your sins, return to Christ again, you're going to find ample forgiveness. There's no end to that. And He's not going to keep you at arm's distance. He's not going to keep you at arm's distance and say, I need you to take a month or two to prove yourself to me again before I'll let you enjoy my love. That's not what's going on here. The initiative is this. It is God saying, I, you are running away, Israel, from me. I'm going to chase you down and catch you and allure you and bring you back into my love. He's not even waiting for them to turn. He's chasing them down. And he makes you and establishes new covenant with them in Christ. But you as a believer, you may be tempted to think so many times, right? Oh, there's no way I can enjoy God's love like this? Like this? We're enjoying His allurement, enjoying His faithfulness and His steadfast love? Yes, you can. And when you turn once again and look to that cross, you'll see that your sins have been crucified and paid for already, and He rose from the dead, and you will know His love permanently. He will not make you a second-rate citizen and wait for you to prove yourself to Him again over and over again. That's not, that's not the way the gospel works. 
The gospel does not wait for you to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and get it all right and then come to Christ. A dead man can't do that. God comes to you and says, live. That's how the gospel works. And then you live. And then we make mistakes, yes, but you know what? He's still our husband. And we're still covered under the blood of Christ. We shouldn't think that just because we've sinned, even as believers, that we are somehow outside of that covenant and the Lord's going to treat us as second-rate citizens. That's not going to happen. This shows you such people as Israel. He even says, I will allure her. God has poured his heart into his people. And this is the old covenant. We're talking about the new covenant here. This unbreakable new covenant. Well, how should we respond? The main point of this sermon is so that we can get a picture of God's heart. God is not thrown about and responding to situations like you or I. Of course not. He knows all things. But he is pre-planned and chosen to close, to covenant, to condescend with a particular people. And he pours his heart out for it. He poured his blood out for it. His bride is very important to him. And so as a church, I want you to understand something, okay? If you are a believer... I could say you are the Stradivarius, but that would be undershooting it, wouldn't it? Because you'd give $16 million for a piece of wood. But he, you're a blood-bought bride. And he poured out his blood for your soul. It's precious. You need to see yourself as precious in the eyes of God. You should see yourself as that. You should see him as well as one who has already and will continue to allure you. He's the one sending the flowers and the chocolates and the, the, the lovely sayings to you through his word all day long. And I want to call you as a church. Know that about your God. Know that about his heart. And don't Turn to earthly fake providers and give credit there. Don't do that. It is offensive. And it is very much like what he's talking about here in this text. A bride should have eyes for only one man. And so it is with his church. And I'm not too worried about it because I believe that God will indeed save all of his church. His blood will never lose the power until they're all there. But I am here speaking to you the word of God saying that you and I must continue to follow after our Savior. Every day we are repenting. We didn't repent once back then, wash our hands of it, and now we're, we're still good here. We repent every day. We live in love with God every day. We recognize that we are living in a world that's constantly vying for our attention. Constantly vying for our attention. Let us not fall into the trap of making eyes at someone else. <coughs> However, if your faith, though, is not in Christ, please understand that the Bible says... You're an enemy of God. You're actually an enemy of the bride of Christ, too. You're an enemy. But here's the thing. Here's the wonderful news. If your faith, if your faith is not in Christ, there still is good news for you. And I'm going to offer it to you right now. God has provided a way where sinful people can be made right with him, where enemies will be given clemency, amnesty. Well, they can be forgiven from all the wrongs that they've ever done or ever will do. And it's not by making amends and trying to pray right and do it all and pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. God knew that you and I could never, ever do that perfectly. We could spend an eternity trying to do that and never, ever pay. 
So what God did was is he became a man and he lived the perfect life, the life that you and I could never live. He died on a cross, suffering, drowning in his own blood for the sins of all who would repent and believe in him. On the third day, he rose again and he beat death. He ascended and he's at the right hand of God, making intercession for all believers. So that if you place your faith in him and say, I've got my hope in, is built in no one else but Christ. My hope is in Jesus. My hope is in Jesus. Then what he will do is, right? This is what Martin Luther called the great exchange. All those sins that deserve the wrath of God were paid for on the cross. And all that righteousness that he deserves, all the blessings that come from his righteous life will be credited to your account. It's a great exchange. He took your sin. And you take the benefit of all his righteousness. You say, that's not fair. Yeah. It's free. What's fair is for you and I to go to hell. That's what you get. That's your wages. Those are the wages of sin. The Lord took those wages on himself. If you will turn from your sins and trust in him, you will be given eternal life, eternal joy, and you will be married to God. You'll be married to Christ, and you will be the bride of Christ, and you'll get to do the wonderful thing that few people get to do, and that's enjoy God. Many. Jesus, right? Many said, many find the broad path. Many, few find the narrow path. But the narrow path is through the narrow wood of the cross. That's the only gate. He paid it all. And if you will repent of your sins and place your faith in him, you will be united by him, united to him by faith. If you are already there, if you're a believer, my friend, enjoy the love, my brother, my sister, enjoy the love of God. We can't enjoy the love of God enough. If you want to talk to me after the service about anything, I am available for you. If you want to talk to your brother or your sister sitting next to you, these people that sit in these pews are also ministers, you understand. And they have an open ear as well. So feel free to talk about your soul, your salvation, or anything that may be going on, but please do come get me after the service. We are going to sing a, a final song, and then Brother Tony's going to come with our uh, benediction. So will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I come before you, and I, would, I do repent, because so often I'm so distracted at other loves, and I pray for forgiveness in Jesus' name. And I, and I just pray, Lord, if there's anything that I said that was just not directly in line with what you wanted to be said or the way I said it was off at all let it be quickly forgotten but I pray that all the truth that was spoken would lay down in the heart like seed and produce fruit 30, 60 and 100 fold and um, pray for people Lord that may be just, just now beginning their walk with you and you would just gently lead them along and that they would know that you're a kind and compassionate father and that they would know that their faith is going to grow or and it's gonna, it may take years and they have a long life of faith to walk with you and that you would just gently lead them and let them know that in their heart but also that if there's someone here today that doesn't know you that they would just simply turn and look to Christ and find forgiveness, find faith, find salvation, find joy. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together for our closing song.